Thanks for being here this morning. We are second week of a series called Choosing Unity. As many of you are aware, we have a presidential election this year. And I just felt that as I was praying and thinking about leading the church, that it was important, especially as a racially reconciling church, that we get ahead of the schemes of the enemy who would want to come and divide us and encourage us as a church family to choose unity. In fact, the biggest decision that we can make in 2020 is whether or not we're going to choose unity. And believe it or not, all the scriptures that tell us to love one another and have compassion for one another and, and, and scriptures around unity and peace, those apply to political discourse as well. See, it's not that people who think like us are on God's side and people who don't are on the other side. Are you hearing me? Right, right. But that we're all in this together, Amen. wrestling with the word of God and what is God's best for our personal lives and our families and our communities. And in fact, as we highlighted last week, there's actually stronger division amongst evangelicals, black and white, when it comes to politics than just a random sampling in the world. See, God cares about issues on both sides of the political aisle. And so here's our declaration. Jesus' church will not be held hostage by a 21st century American presidential election. Amen. In fact, the kingdom of God thrives under every form of government, past, present, in future, in all the nations functioning right now, all the people groups, the kingdom of God is effective and growing in those political mm -hmm. systems. Is our democracy amazing? Absolutely. Are we blessed to be living in America? Without question. But God's plan doesn't hinge on what's happening in an election year. Amen? Amen. So we're going to continue this series. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is clear. God never intended for his people to have an earthly king. And Acts chapter 1 tells us that Jesus' plan was not to uh, increase his kingdom through earthly politics. But boy, do we get excited during an election year, don't we? One of the interesting things about a political season is, is those of us who love and care deeply about intercession and prayer, oftentimes you'll hear highlighted what a prophet believes about the presidential election. I'm so thankful for the prophetic gift. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, is for the encouragement and edification of the church. I loved Alec today just opening up the floor so that we could hear from God. I was encouraged by the message today. That is the prophetic gift being used the right way. What about this idea of someone speaking into the the presidential election as a prophet. Well, I'll tell you an extreme story. I received an email two elections ago, and it was from someone who I cared deeply about, had known them for years, had been praying with them weekly uh, for several years, and they sent me this email, and it was such an interesting email for a lot of reasons, but it said this, Everyone who votes for a certain candidate in the upcoming presidential election will have the angel of death come to their house and kill all the children in their home. Oh, okay. And then it had the audacity to say at the end of it, I mean, if your pastor doesn't agree with this, and he's not following God. 
Now listen, that's shocking in itself, but here was what was more shocking. The sweet person who sent this to me, I mean sweet, sweet person, did not say, oh my goodness, I'm shocked, can you believe this? They were just blindly forwarding, forwarding me that message. Why do I highlight such an extreme example? See, I don't believe God ever intended for the prophetic gift to be used for something like a presidential election. Because for half the church, caring about issues of justice and, and poverty, that declaration that this person's going to be a president or choose that one, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. And for the other half of the, the church that's considering issues of, of stewardship and life and marriage, depending on what the prophet's speaking on any given day, that's discouraging or encouraging. You see, church, it doesn't work this way. We have a choice as the people of God in our presidential elections. And so what happens when we use the prophetic gift to speak into something like er earthly politics, when we search for prophetic answers, we elevate earthly politics and we cheapen the prophetic gift. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I was encouraged by the prophecy, this illustration today about there being dust on the light. That was encouraging, wasn't it? That was yeah. encouraging to us. But every time people who are searching the claims of God and looking for truth and, and wanting to connect their lives to God, when they hear prophecies about presidential elections, they're turned off. They're turned off. And the whole point of the prophetic gift is to encourage, to edify. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it talks about those who are far from God being laid bare to the heart and proclaiming, surely God is among you. You see, the question becomes today, what is our priority? When we spirit, spiritualize an earthly political election, what we do is we elevate it to a place that it should never be given in the first place. So what is our priority as believers? Well, we're going to look at a couple scriptures today. And the first one is going to be just uh, from Acts chapter 1, verse number 3. It says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. This was after Jesus' resurrection. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. And so we touched on this last week, this passage of scripture. Jesus is teaching them about the kingdom of God for 40 days. And then they asked him a question about earthly politics. Jesus, at this time, you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel. Are you going to remove us from Roman, the Roman rule? Are you going to give us a king again? A king you didn't want to give us in 1 Samuel chapter 8. The disciples were doing what we all do, right? We get passionate about the way things are going to play out on earth. And, and they were slow, like, like I'm slow, right? And they're thinking, your plan, Jesus, is going to be political power, isn't it? And Jesus is like, no. You be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Share the good news 
that there's a, a different kingdom, a kingdom that's not from this world, a kingdom that comes from God himself, one where there's peace and joy and unity, a kingdom that's not defined by the divisions of this world, not the earthly struggle for power that we see unfold. I'm doing a new thing. He worded it this way in Matthew chapter 20, verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And he said, surely I'm with you to the very end of this age. So what's our priority as Christ followers? Our priority, church, is to make disciples. It's to share the good news of Jesus. It's to spread this message that there's a different kingdom. And if we're not careful, during an election year, I don't know about you, but this happens to me, you watch the news and you listen to the radio and you hear the talk and you're on social media, and, and when you realize that people don't agree with you, your, your blood pressure starts building, right? And you start feeling that agitation and that frustration, and all of a sudden, it seems like the priority, right, is to have your voice heard or to elect a certain candidate into office. And that, the belief is that is going to make everything right. Here's where the disciples are. Jesus, if you're going to make everything right, you're going to remove the rule of the Roman Empire, and then we'll really have something going. But Jesus' encouragement for us today are... Priority. We talked about perspective last time. Our priority as Christ followers is to make disciples of all ethnic groups. What I love about the Apostle Paul, if anyone was passionate about something, it was the Apostle Paul. He is clear about what he believes. In fact, there's a lot of people still today when they approach the word of God, they want to remove what the Apostle Paul taught on because they don't like his style. But the Apostle Paul represents someone who stood firm in what he believed. He was passionate. He was clear. He cared about things. And yet, he shows this incredible flexibility at the same time to be all things to all people. I believe we have this incredible model in the way he, he encourages us to make disciples of all nations. I want to read this from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 today. It says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. To win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. And to those having the law, I become like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak, and I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel, though I may share in its blessings. And so Paul is willing to be flexible, to be cool with people, right? To go with the flow, to say, hey, if you want me to jump through these hoops, I'll jump through these hoops. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flex and do this for you. And, and I'm going to get to know your culture and know your opinion and understand your ways. And if someone's weak in their faith and they think we need to have all these rules to be right, you know, I'm going to follow all those rules. Because he cared whether or not people knew Jesus. And he was willing to make incredible sacrifices to introduce people to the good news of Jesus. 
Church, what a model for us today as we think about the election. The Apostle Paul sets for us this beautiful model that says, you know what? I'm not going to be so focused on standing my ground that I don't right, represent <laughs> Jesus' kingdom. And at the same time, I'm still going to stand my ground. So one of the challenges that, that we have in a presidential election is you've got to choose a team, right? Because you've got to be on a team. I don't know about you, but when you're on a team, you want to be all in, right? Because if you're going to choose a team, you got to represent, you got to get the merch, right? You know, Jamie works at Xavier University. She came home with a new hoodie on, a Xavier University hoodie. you got to represent, right? And so that's natural. It's natural for us to choose a team. But here's what, what happens if we're not careful. You choose your team, right? Yeah. <laughs> And you're representing, you're all excited, right? <laughs> and you get so excited about your team that, you know, that's what your radio's playing to. And, and, and it's, you know, you start adding some stuff to your social media page to make sure that people know what team you're on. And, and it's what you're talking about around the water cooler, you know, and you're letting people know. And all of a sudden, we forget that something's happening in this equation. That because we've chosen our team, there's people who are far from God who are not on our team. Mm -hmm. And all day long, they're doing the exact same thing that you're doing. And while they're doing that, they're getting frustrated and angry and upset. And so when they come and, and find out from you that you're on that team, they're like, uh-uh. <laughs> if believing in Jesus or attending your church means I'm on that team, I don't want to have anything to do with it, Amen. right? Amen. It, it's not a certain team, right? Amen. It's, it's both teams, right? It doesn't matter what team you're on, right? <laughs> Same difference. You know, I'm representing Team Blue, and I'm doing this and that. And, I, and, and, and what happens is we begin to put the team we're on above or in front of introducing people to Jesus. And so we've got to learn, right, to be passionate about things. We talked about this last week. Choosing unity doesn't mean you don't care. It doesn't mean you don't vote. And it doesn't mean that you don't still passionately engage in issues that you care about. But it does mean that you approach conversations differently, right. that you handle yourself differently when it comes to your social media presence, mm -hmm. and that you're careful on choosing your battles. Right. Political difference doesn't have to equal the division, amen? Amen. I like what it says in Romans, Romans chapter 12, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, if it at all possible... If it depends on you, choose to be at peace with all men. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. If it's possible, and if it depends on you, mm -hmm. choose to be at yeah. peace with all men. It doesn't mean that you're a pushover. It doesn't mean that you still don't care about issues, church. But what do we gain, right? By representing our team so strong that people remain far from God. Amen. Mm. Listen, we need people who stand with strength on things that matter. Yes. Preach. We're all thankful that a man named Mark Luther King Jr. stood up for what he believed in. There were a lot Amen. of people told him, you're doing it wrong, you shouldn't be speaking up, you shouldn't be approaching things this way. Listen, <laughs> things are still challenging around the racial divide in our nation, but what if Martin Luther King never came on the scene? Amen. What if he never stood up for what he believed in? So we need passionate people who care about issues that matter in our community. But we cannot 
put those beliefs, and especially, or more importantly, or more clearly, the team that we're on, above encouraging people to meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus. So as we end our time today, I want to encourage you with this. You can choose unity, and you can walk in peace. Because it does depend on you. <laughs> you can control the way that you engage yes. in this election. And what if we listened? And what if we learned? <laughs> and what if we learned to share our opinion in a way that encouraged others to listen to us? Because sometimes it's just the way you say something. Like, you know, I've been, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about lately, or one of the things that I noticed was this. Let me tell you a story of a family I knew that was impacted in this way. What do you think about that? Instead of just being so, ah, it's hard to hear each other when we're upset, isn't it? It's about Jesus, church. It's about his kingdom. It's about peace. And it's about unity. I was reading this scripture today in Psalm 32. I felt like I should share it today. It said, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. David said, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Listen to this. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. you know Jesus? Have you experienced his forgiveness? Putting your faith in God isn't about joining a political party. It's about having a, a relationship restored with your heavenly father. It's having that feeling that David had of having just feeling like his bones have the strength sapped from him. That's what sin does. It's destructive. It brings chaos. It brings heartache. It brings pain. It weighs us down. It's a heaviness that we feel day after day. God never intended us to live that way. He intended restoration, healing, peace, and strength, prosperity. Fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. God brings good things to our life. So I'd like to join, I'd like to invite you to join me in a time of prayer today. You can just close your eyes and connect with God as an individual. you're here this morning and you recognize like David sin is weighing you down just like David all you have to do is confess your sin and turn to God and the Bible says that he is faithful and just and he will forgive you of your sins it also says that when we confess our sin our sin as far as the east is from the west, 
The distance can't be measured. Your sin is no more. Jesus came not to condemn the world, the Bible says, but he came so that the world would be saved through him. So this morning, if you would like to acknowledge your sin and acknowledge that you need a Savior, i just like to pray with you. I don't want to embarrass you today. What I want to do is encourage you today. And see you in this moment of privacy. Can you just slip up your hand? I want to pray with you today. That's me. I need prayer. I need my sin forgiven. Thank you. Anyone else? I need my sin forgiven. Lord, I thank you for these hands that have been raised today. And I thank you for the promise of your word. And God, you know our hearts, and you know our thoughts. God, you know our questions, and you know our concerns. And God, I thank you that you're, you're big enough to handle all of those things. And I thank you that we can trust the promise of your word. There's a lot of things that we can't trust we can trust the promise of your word today. And so I pray that as we confess our sin today, trust in you, Jesus, to be our Savior, I pray for a freedom to come. I pray for an encouragement to come. And Lord, we also pray as a church family today, and we declare that we choose unity. We want to be men and women of peace. We want to understand our priority to go and make disciples of all nations. And, and Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to approach conversations differently. Lord, I, I pray that we would uh, be reconcilers and peacemakers and unifiers. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.